My name is Lee Brinton. I'm an electrical engineering instructor at Salt Lake Community College. We're going to continue our study of linear devices by turning our attention now to the transistors. Transistors are three terminal devices. The first functioning transistor dates back to 1947. Brayton and Bardeen of Bell Labs are credited with being the first ones to successfully build a functioning transistor. Since that time, transistors have become smaller and smaller and, according to to Moore's law, shrinking about one half in size every 18 months since then. Using current manufacturing technology, transistors are on the order of microns in, develop, in dimension. Designers pack upwards of a couple of billion transistors on a single chip. We'll study two different types of transistors. The field effect transistor, or FET, or FET, and then also the bipolar junction transistors, or BJTs. Each of these accomplish about the same function, although unique characteristics may make one type better suited to a particular application than another. But for a number of reasons, the field effect transistors become the most widely used. In this class, we'll study the operation of the field effect transistor first. We'll first discuss its structure and how it works. We'll develop electrical circuit models to assist in analyzing set transistor circuits. We'll discuss the use of transistors as amplifiers and learn methods of biasing them in a linear region of operation. We'll study a number of different common configurations and study them as amplifiers. We'll conclude by looking at the overall response, which includes the DC and the small signal AC response of the transistor. Transistors are three terminal devices that operate as electronically controlled valves or switches. By varying the voltage or current at one terminal, we can change the amount of current flowing through the transistor between the other two terminals. In the case of the MOSFET transistors, changing the voltage on the middle terminal, which is known as the gate, controls how much current flows between the drain and the source. This is the schematic symbol for the field effect transistor with its gate, its drain, and its source. The source has the arrowhead pointing in the direction of conventional current flow. Thus, by controlling the voltage on the gate, it's something like controlling, electrically controlling a valve, and by opening it more, more current is able to flow through. By closing it, less current is able to flow through. And by changing this gate voltage as a function of time, we can then make the current flowing through here be an amplified version of the controlling voltage. MOSFETs consist of three different doped regions on a semiconductor chip. We'll begin our discussion on how transistors work, looking at what is known as N-channel or N-MOS devices but we will also study P-channel or PMOS transistors too. An NMOS transistor is built on a relatively lightly doped P-type semiconductor substrate that provides the physical structure of the transistor. Diffused into this substrate are two heavily doped N regions, one referred to as the drain and the other known as the gate. Connected between these two regions is a third terminal, or the gate. So we've got the drain and the source, two terminals connected to heavily N-doped areas, and then the gate. The gate is separated from the rest of the silicon wafer by a layer of silicon dioxide that serves as an insulator between the gate and the rest of the transistor. So no current flows into or out of the gate but applying a positive voltage at the gate creates an electric field between the gate and the rest of the transistor that is used to control current flow between the source and the drain. It is this layer of oxidized silicon that gives us the O in metal oxide semiconductor or MOS. The positive voltage on the gate of an NMOS transistor repels holes directly under the gate creating what is known as the depletion region. The gate voltage also attracts electrons from the heavily doped drain and source regions. 
current can flow between the drain and the source through this channel when a voltage difference exists between the drain and the source. This channel, consisting of negatively charged electrons, is known as an N-channel and gives us the letter N in N-MOS. Because the channel of electrons exists in a P-doped area, this layer is also referred to as an inversion layer. Our study of MOSFETs now becomes a study of using the voltage applied to the gate to control the channel and thus control the current conducting characteristics of the transistor. In three dimensions, a FET looks something like this. In the diagram, the drain and the source are clearly shown separated from each other by a distance L. L, then, is what is known as the length of the channel that is controlled by the gate. The width of the transistor, going back into this dimension, the width is designated as W. The three metal terminals are connected to each of the three regions, but again, notice the insulating layer between the metal of the gate terminal and the channel region. You can see that the oxide, the um, silicon dioxide layer here, I'm sorry, here with the hash marks um, with the metal contact of the gate above it. So you've got this insulating region between the terminal and the rest of the and the rest of the body of the transistor. A fourth terminal connected to the body of the transistor is also shown in this diagram. Although there are exceptions, generally discrete MOSFET transistors have the body tied to the source so no fourth terminal is actually brought out. The metal in the name MOSFET is now often a misnomer because the previously metal gate material, which was aluminum, is now often replaced with a layer of polysilicon. Insulators other than silicon dioxide are also frequently used to obtain stronger channels with smaller applied voltages, but nonetheless we still call these metal oxide semiconductors or MOSFETs. This diagram shows the different terms and concepts associated with a field effect transistor. First, we've got the gate connected to the silicon substrate through an insulating layer, shown here as silicon dioxide. Thus, once again, no current flows into or out of the gate. When a positive voltage is applied to the gate, the insulator effectively creates a capacitance between the gate and the substrate. It's actually the electric field within this capacitance that controls the operation of this type of transistor, thus the name field effect transistor, or FET. The heavily doped regions are known as the drain and the source and consist of, or are made up of heavily doped, in this case, N-type dopants. The connections at these terminals do not have that insulating layer. Under the right condi conditions, currents flow, through, flow freely through these terminals. With the source, drain, and body tied to ground, source, the drain, and the body tied to ground, the positive voltage applied to the gate repels the holes under the gate, creating what is known as a depletion layer a region consisting of no unbound charge carriers. The positive gate voltage also draws from the source and the drain, from the heavily doped source and drain, electrons into what then becomes known as the channel. And because this channel exists or consists of negatively charged electrons in what is otherwise a p-type substrate, this channel is also sometimes referred to as the inversion layer. The depth of this channel is controlled by and is a function of the voltage on the gate.